Like I said, I'm Ted Gould, and I'm here to talk about Inkscape. Um, I also want to talk a lot about SVG and understanding the SVG format because that's the basis of what Inkscape works on. And I'm going to go into the SVG, so what are some of the basic SVG tags are, what SVG is useful for, and how people are using SVG, which is also important. Um, Inkscape uses SVG as a space format. So when we start looking at the basic tools that are provided in SVG, you can kind of look at Inkscape as how it manipulates those tools and what it can do for you as an SVG editor. But it's also a drawing program, and I think it's a lot of fun to play with. You get a tablet out and you scribble and all that kind of fun stuff. And there'll be time at the end for questions, hopefully. Um, but feel free to raise your hand and ask questions while we're going. I have no problem with that. So SVG, in its most basic form, is an XML file format. It's written by the W3C, which is the same guys who write HTML and all those great standards. It's XML-based and it's designed for the web. Here's a kind of an SVG snippet, very small. It renders the uh, small square that's on the right there. And from the top header is a standard XML header. The doc type, um, which Firefox won't render your SVGs unless you put that in there, so you might want to remember that. Um, there's a big argument about that, but it seems to be resolved that you need the doc type for Firefox to render SVGs. Then SVG header with the XML namespace defined, which is a lot of boilerplate stuff just to have the command rect for drawing a rectangle. And it has a height and a width and an X and a Y and has a style string, which is a CSS style with the font size, which isn't being used here, but the fill, fill opacity, fill rule, which is when things overlap in a path, how, what, what part of it gets filled. And um, I don't think I actually have a slide on that later. But you can look in the spec if you want to know about, where, about the fill rules. And then the stroke and the stroke width. So in a nutshell, SVG is pretty simple. I mean, you're just, you're just saying, OK, rectangle, width, height, x, y. You've defined a rectangle. It's not very exciting there. But with this, these simple tools that we'll go through provide you a way to create very complex graphics. You can build on them to create something a lot bigger. SVG also is defined as several profiles. There's the SVG main profile, there's SVG basic, and SVG tiny. And what these are is they're smaller subsets of the SVG standard that are designed for PDAs and cell phones. Um, they remove some of the more advanced features of SVG and make it easier for those low CPU, low memory devices to render the SVG content. Now, they were defined back, I think it was 2001, when they started these. And now cell phones are more powerful than my laptop. So I don't know if they're really as practical as they were, once were. But what it does is it provides a nice subset of functionality to say, hey, if we're targeting a mobile phone, it, doesn't, it might be a little crazy to do this feature. And so they're still implemented. Uh, actually, um, Opera 8 implements SVG Tiny. Opera 9 does the full SVG standard. So it's kind of a good benchmark for SVG renderers also. All the phones here shipped with SVG on them. Um, all the PADAs didn't, but um, it's much easier to implement <laughs> SVG on a PDA because most of it's through the web browser anyway. So if you download an Opera or something of that nature to your PDA, you can run it. Cell phones are usually a little bit more closed, so you have to give, get whatever the cell phone manufacturer gives to you. The availability of SVG has increased significantly in the last year or two. Now if you have Firefox 1.5 or greater, you've got SVG. You've got Opera 8 or greater, you've got SVG. There's an Adobe plugin for Internet Explorer that gives you SVG support, um, which sounds bad because plugins are hard to distribute. But most of those plugins have been distributed with Adobe Acrobat and other Adobe software. So a lot of people actually have the Adobe plugin, but if you ask them, they don't know that they do. Um, so don't be surprised if you look and you oh, I already have the plugin. Um, there are later versions with actually security fixes, so I'd recommend downloading the newer version. But a lot of people have, more people have the Adobe plugin than they think they do. Currently, it's in the beta web kit, which is what Apple uses for Safari. And what's really cool about this is that the way they're implementing it, it actually puts SVG into the entire OS. So you'll be able to do SVG icons, and SVG will be first class graphics in Mac OS X, hopefully in 10.5, um, but they haven't committed to that yet. And all vector, all major draw, drawing tools like Illustrator, CorelDRAW, uh, Zara, they pretty much support SVG output as a real format. In CS2 for Illustrator, they support SVG round tripping, so you can pretty much use it as 
the default format. You don't have to use the Illustrator format if that's not what you want. You can save and edit and save and edit in SVG. So SVGs are very real format on graphics editing. Yes. GIMP it doesn't use SVG directly. Like it doesn't, you know, you don't edit in SVG, but you can load SVGs and it'll make the paths in the GIMP based on those SVGs. And you can export the paths based on, as SVGs. And um, we've worked with the GIMP folks actually a bit and making sure that they were more compliant and figuring out, you know, whose bug was it on a lot of the import problems. Um, but they do, will also render the SVGs. They render it and then also make it a path. So you can open a uh, SVG in GIMP and get reasonable results. You're still turning it into a bitmap, though. Oh, the other icon you probably don't notice up here is Scribus, uh, or Scribus. That's an open source desktop publishing program where we've also worked a lot with on get, improving their SVG support. Um, they have really, really good printing support. They do spot color, and they have a really good PDF engine. So we've worked with them a lot on getting SVG into uh, Scribus, Scribus, whatever it is, uh, Scribus. Yeah. I vote Scribus. Scribus? It's Scribus. They can import SVG, and then you can get really nice PDFs with spot colors if you need to publish your uh, SVGs or send them to a printer. It's a good way to go. Obviously, the, one of the big things SVG was designed for was interactive websites. It's the W3C, right? So some examples are out there. Here's a couple that I just pulled to kind of show the features and the feature set that SVG allows and brings to a website. On the left is an example by Adobe, and what it is is it's a ordering website where for a uh, theater, and you can say, hey, I want this seat and that seat. Yeah, you could probably do that in dynamic HTML, but you're, it's going to be a lot harder to get those seats, place the graphics, flip them over, than just having the seat as an object and with a function that's on click and it switches to yellow. SVG provides you a way to do graphics that are interactive in a way that you can edit them with the DOM, you can use JavaScript, all that type of stuff right in the graphic, and it provides a more rich experience for the user then because they can use graphics to interact, and people are graphical. They don't really enjoy reading text as much as they enjoy clicking on a chair. And this, one's, this is a really cool app because also then it lists the chairs in the HTML and then you order them and stuff like that. But this is just one shot of it. I think this is another interesting use of um, SVG that I think is going to be much more popular in the future, and that's overlays. They're using this as a, a map, graphing data of STDs throughout, um, I think it's just London, yeah, London. And you can click on the graphic and say, okay, show me uh, gonorrhea, show me AIDS, and, and it changes the areas based on the neighborhoods and the statistics. And so it becomes a very view visible way of seeing the data that they've collected for years and years and years for the user, and they, they're actually targeting a lot of politicians there because politicians aren't going to read the report, right? They're going to just look at the pretty graphics and look for red and yellow. And so <laughs> we can put that on a web page now with an interactive graphic, and you can see that they actually have the data inside on a different SVG, actually, in that case. And so it's actually HTML pulling together all those SVGs. The Open Clip Art Library is also someone who's using a lot of SVGs. Basically, in the Inkscape project, we started, we had users generating SVG, and they said, hey, this is cool. Can we put this somewhere? Can we put it on your website? Which really didn't match with Inkscape's purpose, because Inkscape's purpose is to make a, excuse me, a vector editor. So we said, hey, we need another project to start collecting all this clip art that people are generating. And so we created the Open Clip Art project, which has a lot of the same people in it, but it's definitely a separate project. And they're now up to over 6,000 SVG public domain images. Um, that's crazy. <laughs> that's a lot of content. And it's really exciting because now you can go and take in your presentation and pull in a graphic and throw it in, and you don't have to worry about the licensing and where you got it from and all those types of issues because it's all public domain. A lot of people criticize the Open Clip Art Project. They're like, well, why is it public domain? Shouldn't you use Creative Commons, share alike? You know, that's more open source. But we take the theory that it's a little bit different than like GPL encode because GPL encode puts restrictions on programmers if they change that program and make another program. But if we said, hey, we're going to do CC share alike, that means that anytime you do a presentation that includes open clip art, you have to share that presentation with the world, which really doesn't make sense for business presentations and it would really hurt the penetration of open clip art. So we've chosen to go with public domain, which is highly controversial, and you can join the mailing list and hear a debate on that about every three months. Um, but that's the way it is. So 
the reason I was involved originally in Open Clip Art was because I was upset that every time you went to a free software conference, the presentations looked really bad. <laughs> they were just text. And that, that always made me angry. And so I'm like, well, you know, the, isn't the people who use Microsoft Office make better presentations or are smarter? It's because they've got all this clip art, and they just click on it, and they pull the little guy in, and it looks nice. So we need clip art for us, too. And so that's one of the reasons to start Open Clip Art Library. GNOME Games. Um, this is an example of SVG where it's not being used on the web. It's being actually used in real applications. And GNOME has the RSVG engine, which is a small library that, uh, in some cases, actually renders SVG faster than it can decompress, uh, libpeng can decompress pings. So it's, it's designed for performance, for icons. And so what they've done in GNOME Games is a version, I think it's 2.10 or 2.12 of GNOME, is almost all the graphics are SVGs. And they're currently working to replace all the ones that aren't SVGs and making SVGs out of them. And while you could say, well, I really didn't need a scalable card in Solitaire, what it allows them to do is edit them afterwards. If for some reason clubs become illegal in France, they can change it to some other thing very easily. Well, if you had pings, you could do it. It would be very difficult. And so the graphics, putting King of SVG makes them effectively open source graphics. And so people can edit them, they can change the colors. And so that's also one of the good things about the Open Clip Art Library. Yeah, we could have made an Open Clip Art Library of all pings. But if you had that calculator on there and you wanted it to be red, it's difficult because someone, the line's anti-aliased, and so you have to figure out where black merged with red and change all of those colors too. But if it's SVG, it's vectored, you can go change the color very easily. Are and you using nested pieces and things like that? So there's one club and then they replicate it, or are they just? I believe they're uh, not doing it that way. I believe they're actually just having every card be an SVG currently. Um, but I imagine they'll change. Uh, I think one of the problems there is Inkscape doesn't really support the nested pieces very well and most of them use Inkscape to create the graphics. Um, it's the same thing with the Project Tango, uh, which is actually working on doing all the icons for most open source desktops and try to create a common commonality, basically, between all of them, common colors, common metaphors, the whole bit. Um, and they use Inkscape. And we put in icon rendering in Inkscape for them so they can see the icons and see what they're actually going to render at. So when you zoom in, everything looks really good, but when it's an icon, Sometimes the anti-aliasing doesn't work. So Project Tango uses the icon uh, preview in Inkscape for that. One laptop per child. Um, unless you've lived under a rock, you probably are familiar with the project. Uh, the idea is that they'll be able to produce $150 laptops. I think they're $130. So they're coming down to for all of the world's children is the goal of the project. And they're specifically targeting developing economies. And they, it's got lots of things designed for kids in there with a the keyboard, the mesh networking, all kinds of things for environments that aren't as wired as the US. One of the things that's cool from the SPG perspective is they have a chat client which allows you to draw. And you, so instead of saying, hello, hey, how you doing? You can draw, hey, how you doing? Or draw a little person or whatever you want. And hit send, and it sends it to the other person. And they've got the SVG there. And that's all done via SVG. And they have, it's actually a custom IM protocol. But what's also interesting about the uh, one laptop per child is the touchpad is significantly larger than a normal touchpad. And they're trying to implement um, tablet-like features. I mean, obviously, it's not like having your own tablet, but so that you can draw effectively. And so that coincides with the chat program where people can communicate in a graphical manner. Uh, maybe in a, with symbols that aren't supported easily on a uh, standard ASCII or 100 key keyboard. This is just a slide to show some SVG features maybe that you hadn't thought about or things that you were saying. I wonder if SVG supports that. It's just a quick smattering. Uh, sort of bitmaps, markers, which are basically uh, arrowheads. Most people think of them. They call them markers in SVG because they can be all different SVG um, objects. Alpha transparency, patterns, which is like putting the polka dot on the text. Gradients, you can do all you want in gradients. Clones, which is basically taking an object and duplicating it by more or less a symbolic link. So if you change the original object, the link to it also changes. So here I've used the word clones, flipped it. But if I retyped clones and made it clone singular, the shadow would also change. SVG has actually been around since about 99, um, but it really didn't make a spec until 2001. 
then it got a major revision in uh, SVG 1.1 in 2003. SVG 1.2 is due out, I would say, any time. <laughs> if you would have asked me last year, I would have said, oh, early 2006, you'll have SVG 1.2. Uh, we don't have SVG 1.2 today. So it should be out any time. They're still bickering in committee, and I try to stay out of it. But some of the features actually are pretty exciting. Uh, flowing text and graphics, which you've actually implemented ahead of them ratifying the spec in Inkscape, which is basically putting text in arbitrary objects. Also have multiple pages, which is good for flyers, stuff like that. Text enhancements, basically being able to have more flexible text objects. Uh, in SVG 1.0 1.1, you could do things with multiple text objects, but now you can put them in the same tree, which makes things a little bit easier. Streaming and progressive rendering, those are, they kind of go hand in hand, but the idea is that you could do it before, and actually RSVG supports that a little bit, but now they're actually putting it in the spec, and here's how you guarantee that your SVGs stream, here's how you guarantee that your SVGs will progressively render, and putting features in the spec for it. Vector effects, these are, um, just different things that we get done to vector objects, and there are standard properties that could be applied to them, and then they're also putting in audio and video. So, of course, all of these are conditional on them actually approving them in the spec, so things may change in the next month, but these are the most of the things that I'm excited about and seem to be relatively stable and in going into the spec. Um, I think probably one of the most interesting things is audio and video, um, because I know, I mean, Google Video is an excellent example where they've gone and they've used Flash because it provides a standard interface for sending video. And if you could use SVG for that, that would actually be using a browser feature instead of needing a plugin. So one of the points I really want to drive home is that SVG is XML. And I'll say it again and again and again. But that's a really, really cool feature because you've already got tools that you've used with XML. You probably have all your key bindings in your favorite editor set up for XML. You've got XML features you've used before. XML probably feels okay. And you can use all the same things you used with XML with SVG. And I just throw up acronyms up here and different phrases because these are some of the things that a lot of people use and they're really, really useful things. But now you just get to use them with SVG too. And so like if you want to change SVG into a different format, maybe KML, you could use XSLT to do that. You wanted to use uh, SVG inside an HTML page, you could use XML namespaces, and SVG will embed, in, embed inside the uh, HTML. If you want to progressively load and background load on a web page, you can use AJAX to background load SVGs the same way as you do HTML. If you want to use JavaScript in a web page to edit the structure of the document, you can use DOM. And if it's embedded in your document with XML namespaces, they're actually the same DOM as your HTML. So you can edit everything together, which is really interesting. Unicode, it already supports it. It's XML. XML supported it. SVG gets it. Language bindings. I think every programming language has XML bindings. Um, I'd be surprised if there wasn't one that didn't. Maybe Fortran doesn't, but um, I don't know how many people are parsing text with Fortran. Uh, it's probably a limited subset. But probably any language you're using today has XML language bindings. And there are additional features in an SVG DOM but 99% of the ones you're going to use are just the XML DOM. So you can get a lot of functionality just by using the XML key bindings that are already in your language. Or not key bindings, but language bindings that are already in your language. Basically, SVG starts with a lot of primitives, and then you can build up from those to create more complex graphics. Some of the basic drawing primitives are rectangle, ellipse, polygon, circle, polyline, and line. These are pretty straightforward. They pretty much go by their name. Rectangle is interesting because you can do curved line, curved edges, which is great for diagramming. Ellipse is just the uh, exposition and raise height and width. Polygon, I don't think that needs too much explanation. It's of five points to do it, and then it fills it. Polyline is, it doesn't fill it. <laughs> Circle, center and radius. Line, x1, x2, or x1, y1, y2, y2, x2, y2. And that can create a line. What's really interesting is when you start going into paths, because paths allow you to specify arbitrary objects that can be effectively infinitely complex. And in SVG, the way paths work is there's an attribute on the path element that is D, and then D has a grammar associated with it. And that grammar is basically 
ASCII character and a specified number of numbers, either integers or floats, that go into that, affect that letter. And so the basic ones for drawing straight lines are move to, line to, horizontal line, vertical line, and then you can close the path. The, also with every one of the letters, I almost forgot to say, there's capital and there's lowercase. Capital means that it's an absolute. Lowercase means that it's relative. So if you want to specify your line starting at a point and then all relative, you can do that. Just use all lowercase character characters. Usually you probably want to start your first move to when you create your polygon with a capital M. Um, I guess you could do relative. It would be relative from 0, 0, but it makes more sense <laughs> to be absolute for the first point. But So here's a little example, four points. Or you just moved to 555 and 320. Then we did a horizontal line for 200. So we started here, horizontal line. Just did a line two down here to an absolute coordinate, capital L, which is 635, 475. And we did a negative vertical line, which goes up. And then we closed the path. And capital doesn't matter on closed path because there's no absolute or relative view, but both lowercase and uppercase work. Next slide. <laughs> two of two. So <laughs> you can also do curves in a variety of ways. Probably the most useful is curve two, which is a uh, Bezier curve. And I'll get into those a little bit more if you're not familiar with them. But you can do move two and then curve two. And now what that does is that takes three additional points, which are point one, which is our move two, then one, two, three which are two control points and then the second base point. There's also a shorthand notation where you can skip one of the control points and it assumes that it's symmetric with the previous control point. That's a shorthand mode. SVG also supports quartic curves and shorthand quartic. Um, I don't think they're as useful because you only get one control point and you can't do as much with them. But if you're trying to compress an SVG, obviously having one control point saves you a little bit of data. There's also Arc2, which uses ellipses and partial ellipses. And I think it's really overly complex. Um, I'd recommend reading the spec if you really want to know more about it. But you can do some cool stuff. Bezier curves are an interesting, interesting development. They're basically two base points and two control points that could define any curve. So they were popularized by a French engineer named Pierre Bezier who was interested in automobiles. And so he took his automobiles and he was drawing them and he wanted to be able to draw the curves and specify the curves mathematically. And he started using what are now called Bezier curves. Excuse me. So, let's see. It's just the base points, the control points. That's all I wanted for the slide. Basically what happens is the control points affect where the curve moves between the base points. I like to think of it as, the line always goes through the base points, and then it's pulled by the control points in a specific direction. Another way to think about it is that the curve always intersects the base point in the direction of the line that connects it. So you can see here where I've got kind of the line here, and it curves in and always intersects at that line. So you can think of it as turning how it has to curve, and so then the line kind of molds based on that. It seems overly complex when I'm sitting here explaining it to you and you haven't played with them, but I encourage you to go open up Inkscape, play with them a little bit, and you're like, oh, okay, that's not too bad. I can kind of make what I want. It's, it's not really that difficult once you get used to them, but they are a little bit complex to explain. What you really need to know is that there's base points. Your lines will always go through the base points, and you have control points, and those are going to affect how the curve goes. If you pull the lines out, the curve's going to be pulled to those, those control points more and further away from the base points. For those that like math a little bit better, <laughs> this is not the standard way that actually Bezier curves are explained, but I think it's actually a little more intuitive this way. It's just an algebraic reshuffling of the standard formula that if you've taken a computer graphics class, you've probably seen. Though it, what it is is that Bezier curves are defined in a parametric manner. And I've just included the x up here. The y is exactly the same. If you prefer y, replace all the x's with the y's in your mind, and that'll be y. So what we can see is the way I've defined the formula is in how x0, x1, x2, x3 are impacted and coefficients on those. So x0 is our first control point. x1 
or, or yeah, our first base point. X1 is our first control point. X2 is our second control point, And X3 is our second base point. This is the same way the SVG spec was doing it. I've kept them consistent throughout the slides. So what we can see with these coefficients, if we go from t from 0 to 1, because that's what a parametric equation does. It goes from 0 to 1. And then we look at the influence of them, of how much influence it has on the total line from 0 to 1. So when we start the curve, m0 is having all of our influence. And m0 is on x0. So we are going to intersect x0 at t equals 0. As we start moving across, you'll see that m1 has more and more impact. Eventually, as we get about to the middle, we're saying, OK, well, m0 is dying out. We're pretty much m1 and m2. And then by the time we get to the end, x3 has all the impact. So what ends up happening is you start at m0, or x0, and you start end at x3 with a varying influence in the middle. But what's interesting also is that you notice throughout this curve, you don't end up in a case where m1 or m2 dominates. So the, uh, the Bezier curve can intersect the control points. But that's not really part of it. That's just happenstance that if it curves back, it happens to go through one of the control points. Is a question? OK. So I think that's a little more intuitive way to look at Bezier curves. You can just see them as having different impacts. And you can see the impact of the different points as we start to go moving through the curve. On SVG, there's a transform attribute. And a transform attribute can be applied to any element. It can be applied to groups. It can be applied to the whole document. Um, some of the most useful transforms are rotate, skew, scale, and translate. And this has another pseudo syntax that's attached to it. So you have an attribute, which is transform. And then you can start attaching these. And you can just put spaces between them, put as many as you'd like. If you want to translate, skew, then rotate slightly, and then translate again, that's totally fine within the SVG spec. The, each one's pretty simple. It's just scale, x, y, translate, x, y. And in most of these, the y can be left off if you don't want to translate in the y direction, but require the x because you need the x to feed the y. And then also, there is a matrix operator. So if you really do like doing the matrix math the old-fashioned way, you don't need to use the shorthand. And you can use the matrix operator to do anything you'd like. In SVG, you have fill and stroke, which are basically how the object gets filled or how the lines get drawn on the object. And one of the interesting things about uh, SVG is that you can do all the strokes with everything you can do in the fills. Uh, formats like Flash don't support gradient strokes. So if I define a fill and I set the proper CSS property of fill to be you know, red, the fill will be red. If I set the stroke, to be red, stroke will be red. But I can also set it to be a, another uh, object in the document. So let's say a pattern or a gradient. And so I can set, here's my polka dot pattern as a stroke. Everywhere where there's uh, the polka dot and the stroke intersect, we see graphic here. Here's my polka dot pattern as a fill. And you can see what happens there is we have effectively a polka dot object. And you can define in the patterns how the intersect. So if I don't like the polka dots here and I really want the dot over here, something like that, I can adjust that and how the alignment happens between the pattern and the object. The same way with the stroke. We've already seen that we support gradients. Uh, gradients are pretty simple in SVG. It basically comes down to you do have a gradient which goes across an area from 0 to 1 and you have a bunch of gradient stops. And so gradient stops can be any uh, SVG color. So it can be the traditional red, or it can be a hex, a hex code, like you know, pound FF00FF. Or it can be ICC colors, which are also supported in SVG. So here's a simple gradient. It just starts off, and it goes start, at position 0. It starts at color black with an opacity of 1. At position 1 quarter, it still stays black, but we go to alpha 0, so it becomes transparent, which since the background is white, you really can't tell the difference between that one and the one in the corner. But I guess I probably should have put a graphic behind it. But it actually becomes transparent. At the very far, far corner over there, you can see what we did is we made it go all the way to black and full opacity. And then over here, it goes all the way to white. So what ends up happening is you interpolate between the steps in a linear manner. 
And so you can create more complex gradients, but you end up having to do it iteratively. So if you want to do a parametric gradient, you have to specify the points and you get some sort of almost aliasing, I guess, would be the term for that type of gradient. But for most people, gradients are linear complex enough. And you can do radial gradients and lay gradients on top of each other. So you end up having complex gradients, even though you don't have necessarily all the features that you could possibly imagine. There's a lot more to SVG that I'm not going to cover today because it's complex, but I just wanted to highlight just to get, make sure that they're on your radar of things that, hey, I wonder if I could do that with SVG. Hey, I'll look at the spec. You can do patterns. I didn't go into them more than just saying that they do exist, but they're, they can be interesting because you can make a pattern and then refer to it by multiple objects. So if you wanted to, say, have a pattern be a graphic and then have views into that graphic, you could use the same graphic once and then have a bunch of different views into it. Animation, there's the animation object in SVG. I think it's more useful for things like sprites, like if you want to have a button that blinks in and out, you can make that an animation object in SVG and then have JavaScript control whether it's blinking out or not. People do use it for more complex stuff, but I think that's where it's more useful. Filter effects, these are uh, things like drop shadows and gradients. Um, we don't currently support those in Inkscape, so it's really hard to make slides that show how it works, but that's one of our Google Summer of Code projects. Clipping and masking is what you expect to be able to clip graphics, mask them, pull out different areas when you duplicate objects. And SVG also supports embedding fonts. The fonts aren't true type. You can't put all the hinting and all that type of stuff inside. But it is good enough for embed all the fonts, send this to my customer. Or I want to have this font on my web page embedded inside the graphic. Inkscape. SVG is a really neat format in the fact that it's got a lot of simple primitives, but then to do something more complex, it really starts to get crazy. I know there's a couple of you in the room going, hey, I can do all that with Emacs. And you can. <laughs> I don't recommend it, but you can, because what happens is these graphics start to get complex, when you, especially when you do have multiple gradients. And even this presentation slide, I have, I think it's six gradients on the screen right now, just going across the different um, the Inkscape logo in the corner, the background gradient, the gradient of the black line there. And yeah, you can do all that in a text editor. But if you want to draw the Mona Lisa in a text editor, more power to you. I'll use Inkscape. It's open source, which is a neat thing because you can download the source code and actually make it compile on any platform you like. But we already do support Windows and Linux and OS X. And there are people who have got it compile even on Solaris and IRIX. Um, so I haven't actually seen it running on those platforms. It's a vector illustration program, which is similar to Adobe Illustrator, or Corel Draw, or Zara. You may have used some of those tools. A lot of people have a fondness for MacDraw. If you really like MacDraw, it's exactly like MacDraw. Um, we use SVG as our native format, which means that every document that you save in Inkscape and SVG, in Inkscape SVG, will have all the data. All, everything to come back and edit it. You save where you are. It'll save all of the things you configured. All that type of stuff will be in the file. We do that by uh, doing an XML namespace on top of SVG, where we add all the editor data that people expect to have in a vector illustrator that doesn't necessarily in SVG as a, just a vector graphics format. So we also provide a save as plain SVG, where we pull that namespace out. If you're publishing to the web, or if you're just, you want to lose that data for something, you can do that in Inkscape. It's included in all major Linux distros. We called Microsoft and asked them to include it in Vista, but they really haven't called us back. I, I don't know what the deal is there. Maybe we've got the wrong number. And um, InkView can be used for slides. I didn't use it today because it doesn't um, do full screen on OS X, but I do use it on Linux, which I can't do, get to do video out. So <laughs> it does work well for if you can get your laptop to do video out and you know, Linux. Inkscape started uh, from a couple of code bases. The original one was Gil by Ralph Levin, Levian, and that was back in 99. If you remember back to our SVG timetable, that was pretty much when the first working draft came out. Ralph was really on SVG before it really became popular at all. He got tired of the project, basically, and so Laura said, hey, can I take that and make that into my own thing? And so he took the Gil code base and made it into Sodipody. Uh, 
SodiPoty developed for quite a while until the Inkscape team decided to fork it and make Inkscape, which was started in November of 2003. And so then we've continued on indefinitely. I don't believe SodiPoty is currently being developed, but I'm not that familiar with their development. I'm not on the mailing list or anything like that anymore. Um, if you look at the screenshots, it's kind of interesting to see how it's progressed. This is the original Gil, which is, um, I'd say, barren. <laughs> it's maybe not what you'd expect when you're drawing a vector graphics, but it did the job and it had basically the core of what SVG was and what SVG was going to become. So it's important to note in the history. And you can see um, Sodipodi really, really started to get a lot of the complex shapes. And you can see there's a lot of complex drawing that's already can be done in Sodipodi. Um, unfortunately, a lot of that's in the render, and you can't get to it via the GUI. But there's a lot of neat stuff that can be done in SodiPoty. And then we think we've really taken it to the next level with Inkscape. You can see where we've done some really complex gradients in this screenshot. And you can see how the user interface has changed significantly. And that's one of the things we're proud of. We think we have an intuitive user interface. Um, a lot of people can sit down and start drawing with Inkscape without really understanding the power that's involved in Inkscape. We have menus that we've actually thought about. We, we sit down and go through the menus and say, hey, what really belongs here? So we like to say the menus are well thought out. Of course, everyone will disagree. And when there's an XML format, you can change the menus if you'd like. We have quick access tools on the left. But then as you click these, we get a context sensitive menu bar. So currently, this screenshot's in node view, uh, editing. And so all these tools here on the second toolbar are things you'd use while you're node editing. If you go to the rectangle tool, things will pop up that are useful while you're using the rectangle tool. Um, I think Microsoft's using it in ribbons in their new uh, office. It's kind of the same idea. The idea is that when you're working with this particular tool, you've got other toolbars that are useful. And so that switches, depending on which tool you're in. We have fast layer selection down here, which I just love because I work in a lot of layers. And it's really easy just to flip them around right there in the bottom of the screen. Um, this is my favorite comment on this slide. It's actually a useful status bar. Because in my experience, most people have stopped using the status bar. They've stopped, they've, they ignore it. It might as well not be there. Because they're not really useful. There's not a lot of useful information there. But on Inkscape, we've really tried to put, hey, this is what you need to know right now on the status bar. And you can see where I am. I'm editing two nodes. And it says, hey, you've got two of two nodes selected. You can drag the nodes with the node handles. If you use Alt-Drag, it's, well, it's cut off because I shrunk the screen for taking the screenshot. It says, hey, if you alt drag the nodes, it's going to adjust all the nodes around it for you. And so that information is available so you don't have to really memorize the entire key map of Inkscape, which is huge. We've got tons of key codes. But most of the ones you want, they're right here on the status bar. So you just flip down, look for the bold stuff, and you can figure out what you're doing. Boolean operations. Um, these are probably, you, you remember these from school. You've done them in C, you've done AND, all those type of things. But what we can do is we can do those with graphics. And this is really important when you're creating graphics because there's a lot of primary shapes, your circles, your rectangles. But chances are you're not publishing circles and rectangles. You want shapes that are a little more complex than that. And Boolean operations make it easy to draw those shapes. You can take a circle and add a square to it, and it kind of looks like a light bulb. Those things are a lot easier when you can just draw circles and squares and then compose those together. So Inkscape provides a full set of Boolean operations that you can do to all your paths, no matter how complex the paths get. So if you want to add two paths together, cut two paths across each other, that's all supported in Inkscape. And this is something that's not in the SVG spec. The SVG spec has nothing about Boolean operations. And it doesn't need to, because it defines a path. We've got two paths, and we make a third path, or in some cases, one path out of the two paths. And so SVG provides the basic element that we can use, but then Inkscape uses that to create something better. And so that's why I think if you can get the feel of why you'd want to use Inkscape, the reason is because you can take these basic elements and manipulate them together. Bitmap tracing, this is also a really useful feature because I, I don't know how many of you worked with a client and they go, hey, here's my logo. I, I had it done four years ago and this guy gave me a JPEG of it. Is that useful? And you're going, no, <laughs> it's really not. <laughs> we need to put it on these flyers, and it's just going to look awful. And so you could trace it in Inkscape. And I wouldn't say the tracing is 100%. You're not necessarily, not, not necessarily going to have something you want to just throw on the printer right away. But it gives you the basic format of anything, and then you can start editing it. Here's one where we've done a flower. 
and that's kind of complex is because it's photorealistic. You probably wouldn't want to edit that, but you can clean it up. We have smoothing tools and stuff like that to refine the image after you've traced it. Oh, and credit goes to Potrace. That's the library we included uh, to get bitmap tracing. We also have what's called clone tiles. We talked about clones a little bit either, earlier, which are basically symbolic links to another object. And because of the XML nature of SVG, it's a tree, and so when you put a style, like a cascading style sheet, when you put a style at the top, that cascades down to all the other objects. And so what we can do is we can say, okay, we've got one object, this little circle up in the corner. Let's make all these symbolic links. Let's change how that cascades down. And so what we can do is that we can say, okay, this has the properties of black, but it doesn't have the properties of transparency on it. So when I cascade it, I'll put transparency in all the ones that I cascade from. And so it creates really complex shapes and styles using only one object. You've only got one object in this entire thing, which is probably this one, I would guess. And then you drip down. And it can do randomness and alpha and color and position, all these types of things when you edit and create this clone tile. And so you've got a very simple object that you've created a complex drawing with. There's also the ability to have the color map to another image. And so I saw a demonstration where a guy took this, basically this shape, and mapped it to a painting. And it looks like it has brush strokes because it's kind of different as the colors changed as it goes over the painting. So clone tiles are very interesting in that you can create more complex shapes from something very simple. Excuse me. Extensions. Extensions are included in 4.4. Uh, they're actually available in earlier releases, but they're, uh, you have to go to the preferences and enable the experimental feature. But in 4.4, extensions are, are, effects are there. Extensions have always been in Inkscape. But one of the goals we had in Inkscape was to create first class extensions. And what we mean is we want to be able to move code out of the core and into extensions without the users ever noticing. We want to create a small core with as little as possible so that it can be fast and optimized and all those extra features are outside. So one of the first things we realized is XML is a text format, and there's a lot of tools out there that work with XML already. Why are we going to reinvent our own? So we've got standard in, standard out. Boom, we can use all these tools. We can use all these format converters. And so we've defined a format we call scripts, where you can define a script and use that script in Inkscape, and the user doesn't know. There's an uh, illustrator to SVG converter, they go file, open, click on the Illustrator file, and it opens. Yeah, it was running a script, and it used Perl, and all this type of other stuff, but the user doesn't care. They open their Adobe Illustrator file. And that's all taken care of by Inkscape behind the scenes. The effects are new in 4.4. They're actually not experimental anymore. And these are the examples of some of the effects we have. We have about 20 or 30 currently in 4.4. Uh, interpolate paths, took each of these paths and interpolated them down to a line. Uh, you can also interpolate between arbitrary paths. Uh, blur edge copies uh, a particular object and ex eh, extends it out, creates a larger uh, offset, outset. Uh, an L system plotter, if you want to make trees for a forest or anything else, and it's just kind of a fun thing to play with and creates nice screen candy. If the thing I wanted to uh, stress the most in this presentation was SVGs XML, the second thing I want to stress in the presentation is that there's really cool interactive tutorials in Inkscape. In Inkscape, we've got tutorials that are actually SVG files, which means that instead of going in there and saying, well, you can edit rectangles like this, it goes, hey, there's a rectangle there. Edit the rectangle like this. And so what ends up happening is you can actually interact and use the tutorials and use the tools while you're looking at the tutorial, which is really, really great, and I don't know why everybody else doesn't do that, but it creates a way that you can learn without having to have like two or three monitors. So <laughs> there's really great interactive tutorials. There's been a lot of time put into them. They're translated into whatever language you like. Um, not whatever, but they're, they're translated to, I think, four or five languages, or maybe even up to ten now. We've had a huge translation push for the last release. There's basic shapes, advanced, tracing. Calligraphy is really great. It actually goes into the history of calligraphy. So if you're at all interested in calligraphy, I'd actually recommend just reading the tutorial because it actually is interesting reading. Um, there's two that I think that the engineers probably should read, which is Elements of Design and Tips and Tricks, because most of the time when I've met engineers, they don't really understand composition. 
And so if you want pretty graphics, that's a great way to go do pretty graphics because you start to learn about, okay, what's color here? What's, um, what's, what, what, what is my layout doing? What is it meaning? And elements of design. It's actually written by a guy who teaches art classes in San Francisco. So it's, it's real. Layers. Um, in Inkscape 44, we added a layer dialog. I showed you the quick select layer a little bit earlier. I pointed it out. But that's just at the bottom, which is very useful, actually. But we also have a full layer dialog. What's interesting about layers is they're actually just implemented as SVG groups, which are just basically simple uh, containers for other SVG elements. But then what we've added is an XML namespace, Inkscape group mode, and you can set that to layer. And then we pull them out as groups, and we can add names to them and add them to the GUI, which makes it so you can create more complex graphics. And my favorite feature is actually the lock because that causes me not to edit everything at the same time and I can actually focus on what I'm doing. Inkscape also supports putting RTF metadata inside the SVG file, which is actually a really neat feature for large art shops where they're saying, okay, where did I get this document from? Do I have license to use it in Spain? Um, what license did it come with? This type of information is really, really useful for those type of people because when you put the wrong graphic on a billboard, it's hard to take it down. So having that information inside the file is very, very important for large art shops which have complex licensing agreements with all kinds of vendors. And of course, we have a good smattering of all the Creative Commons licenses that we'd like them to use. <laughs> Just a little encouragement. Inkscape also has an XML editor, and this is probably where most of the people in the room will find themselves in Inkscape because they really want to tweak something, right? And you just can't do it with the detail you want in that editor. You got to go change it number by number. And so you can go into Inkscape, pop open the X, uh, XML editor, and actually select individual tags, edit the attributes, hit Control Enter, and that attribute takes effect right then. You rearrange elements, it takes effect right then. It's a live editor on the Inkscape. XML tree internally. So this is a very cool feature for if you need to really tweak your XML or you want to do specific IDs on specific objects because you want to be able to refer to them by get ID in the DOM, you can do that in XML editor very quickly. As I'm closing up, I wanted to actually say what we did for our Google Summer of Code projects because I imagine most of you are shareholders in Google so you know where your money's going. Uh, for 2005, we uh, built an Open Clip Art repository browser, which actually allows you to drag and drop Open Clip Art repository into Inkscape. And I think one of the cooler features is that also it supports a local repository. So if you download all of Open Clip Art and untar it on your machine, it works. But it also supports a remote repository. So if you don't want to download it all to your machine, you just want to grab specific graphics, it'll do that too. Uh, Inkboard, which is our Jabber chat feature, you can actually use Inkscape over Jabber to work with work groups or individual users. The work group features and the actual integration into the main code base was uh, finished last summer. DXF format didn't actually work out. Um, the, what? <laughs> the guy who did it um, didn't quite get the spirit of the project. It was, oh, I'm really too busy to do this. Well, it's your job. Um, <laughs> you're kind of getting paid for it. Well, I guess in the end he didn't. But um, <laughs> yeah. the, uh, um, it's well studio, used. Studio, uh, yeah. would be better <laughs> well, the funny part about it is uh, like we do have some DXF or export, and there's a community in the UK of people who do scrapbooking, like uh, this is the memory books, and there's a um, cutter that uh, you can cut individual shapes out of that takes DXF files. And Inkscape's created, gotten a huge following in these uh, scrapbooking community where they're drawing custom graphics to cut out on this cutter. And so they exported DXF and actually used the cutter. And so I, when, when we started Inkscape, I never would have thought scrapbookers in the UK was a target market. But it's a, <laughs> there's a whole huge amount of tutorials and everything on using Inkscape on these scrapbooking websites, which is, I think is really cool. Well, we also have connectors for shapes, so you can say, okay, this shape, draw an arrow to that shape, and as you move the shapes around, it redraws the lines for you. Um, that was also done for an Inkscape Summer of Code project, or Google Summer of Code project, and you can also avoid objects, so if you want everybody to avoid that square, it'll route around different objects. <laughs> 
2006, which has just started. Actually, midterm evaluations are here in a couple weeks. Um, we've got two people working on SVG filter effects. Those are things like uh, drop shadow and other bitmap effects that are, can be defined in SVG. We don't currently support this in Inkscape. And I, and I think it's basically agreed on that's one of the biggest parts of the SVG spec we haven't implemented. So we're very excited. Um, we had a ton of proposals on it, and two guys were actually interested in different parts of it. So we said, hey, work on it together, and we'll hopefully have, by the end of the summer, a really world-class SVG filters implementation. Um, the library we used for Inkboard didn't really compile on Windows. They, they said they support Windows. Um, nobody really got it to link correctly, and there was a huge amount of problems. So we need to switch libraries. We also need to document it because the Jabber folks want to standardize on a whiteboard protocol because there's, I think, three implementations now of SVG over Jabber, and we really want one to be right. And so to do that, we need to actually document our protocol, which we haven't done. So that's one of the projects. Uh, lastly, memory optimization. Unfortunately, Inkscape is a memory hog, um, especially if you get large, significant graphics. It starts to really suck up the memory. Um, we're going to hopefully fix that. And we've also got memory leaks. We've actually added garbage collection to most of our core objects, which has helped that a lot. But it still, over time, does leak memory. So we're hoping profiling and fixing and profiling and fixing and profiling and fixing will make Inkscape a lot better. Uh, lastly, which is the one I'm mentoring, is PDF export via Cairo. Um, obviously, we can use other things because Cairo has backends besides PDF, but PDF is the core format for exchanging graphics really today. If you want to send a graphic to a customer and you're drawing it in Inkscape, PDF's really where you want to go. And so we can get PDF output easily using Cairo, but it also allows us to understand Cairo and how it's going to impact Inkscape so we can start to look at changing Inkscape's core canvas over to Cairo also. The future of Inkscape is further SVG compliance. Uh, filters is a huge part of that, but there's actually a lot more of the uh, SVG spec we need to implement. Um, further support of things like the SVG switch statement, which allows you to do conditional text based on language and stuff like that, is important for Inkscape to be fully SVG compliant. We want to switch to a Cairo render, as I men mentioned. We need more color management for professional environments. People need things like spot colors which we can't currently do. We actually, in this release, we link to little CMS, which is a CMS implementation that's open source, which gives us a lot of that, but we need to actually finish implementing all those features and providing them to the user. Path effects are another way we're going to go with the effects to have it actually interact with a path. So if you want to say, okay, I'm going to draw my path, and then I want it to look like it was stroked with a marker, well, you can apply path effect. But yeah, you can do that once, which isn't very exciting. But if you can go back and edit it as a path and still have the marker outline or a brush, that's really interesting. And so that's what we want to be able to do with path effects. Uh, hopefully after the summer of code, we'll be able to have Inkboard compiled by default. We haven't, don't have it compiled by default now because it's not supported on Windows, and we want to have everything supported across platform. So it's an optional compile. Hopefully at the end of the summer, we'll be able to make it compile by default. Then every Inkscape user will have ink. ink board support, which unfortunately some Jabber servers don't like because it's too much data, so we'll, everybody will be upset at us for crashing Jabber servers. We also want to add improved tablet support. Inkscape does have tablet support today, um, but it's mostly pressure tilt, which are the important ones, but things like erasers and advanced features like that. So we've got all the basic tablet support. If you pull out a tablet, you can play with it and use the calligraphy tool, and it looks really nice. But we want to be able to add full tablet support, and before we feel we can say that, we need to support all of the idiosyncrasies of tablets. I told you I'd bring it up again, SVG's XML. <laughs> You've got a lot of XML tools in your, in your pocket already, and you can use those with SVG with very little retooling. Inkscape is taking over, or SVG is taking over the internet. Um, I thought I'd put it in there. If I can convince you of that, that's great. <laughs> I don't know that it's taking over the internet yet, but I think it is gaining a lot of momentum. Uh, implementations are really supporting it today. You can, as a web developer, actually, you know, most of the time people do have SVG support. And so that means that necessarily you shouldn't be changing your website to SVG today, but you probably should have a plan for, hey, how am I going to use SVG when it comes and actually becomes very, very real in people's implementations. Inkscape will help you create SVGs however you want to do them. Inkscape's really good there. You can also do other cool stuff. There's people who use Inkscape for art. 
um, all kinds of crazy stuff that I never would have thought you could use Inkscape for, like scrapbooking. And it's just it's a good graphics editor, even though if you don't care about SVG, you can use it as a graphics editor and use it to print out flyers or make presentations. And I also just wanted to say thank you again for Google Summer of Code. We're really happy to have the contributions. Links. Um, for anyone who cares, I haven't put the presentation there yet, but I will. Uh, SVG's website is graphics SVG, Inkscape.org, and SVG.org has lots of good information on SVG. If there's, a, they've got like a listing of all the phones that support SVG. If there's a new tool that comes out for SVG, it'll be on SVG.org. It's just a very specific news site for SVG-related materials. And questions? Thank you. I'll start. Attach what? Yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 Firefox will allow you to do that, and you just have the standard. It's basically the same as HTML. You've got like on click, on mouse over, on mouse out, same type of events, and then you can Is that put. Supported by, like, the, the Adobe yes. Yep, it's supported by Adobe. Actually, Adobe, um, in their plugin, has their own JavaScript implementation, so you don't have to deal with the JavaScript implementation in IE. So it's even, it's even better than that. <laughs> so uh, is there an output to uh, something you could import into a type document for typesetting? Yes, there's a um, format. I have, it's uh, PS Tricks, I think is what it is. It's a LaTeX. It can be used for LaTeX. Um, I haven't used it myself. Yeah. Um, I, I haven't used that myself, but I know that people use that for LaTeX a lot. Um, but. Can you uh, explain a little bit more about the, the CG filter effects? Okay. Like, in conjunction with that, I was just curious, the, my one favorite feature of uh, Illustrator that I don't see here is the mesh gradient. I was no mesh gradient. Yeah. There's a rumor that it was going to be in 1.2, but I haven't seen anything that I would consider a Yes, it's definitely going to be one one point two. For the most part, mesh gradients can be done with overlapping radial gradients. I mean, uh, obviously, it's a little bit more difficult to manage there. Um, but yeah, mesh gradient isn't in SVG, and we couldn't figure out a way. We thought about oh, how could we implement these? Could we use multiple radial gradients and you know emulate a mesh gradient? But the math really doesn't work out. You can do it perfectly, and so. We couldn't provide an interface that did a mesh gradient and implemented in a way that other SVG renderers could see it. So, and what I did is I was like, oh, I, how does Adobe do it? If Adobe did it some way, we can just steal the same way Adobe does it, right? Well, if you export um, a mesh gradient in Illustrator to SVG, it's a bitmap. <laughs> oh, you cheated. <laughs> I was trying to figure out how they did the math, but no, they just cheated. They did a bitmap. Um, filter effects. Uh, Probably the biggest one is the like uh, blur. So you can do uh, an arbitrary object and say, drop a blur behind it, and it will be actually a full gradient, uh, full uh, Gaussian blur. And so there, there's all kinds of uh, effects. That's the one that comes to mind most when I think of filter effects, and that's the one we're going to implement first. But what's cool about it is that you can say, OK, I've got an entire layer, and it's got 50,000 objects on it, whatever. And then you can say, OK. As, add my blur to that. And so then it has a drop shadow of all those objects, which is really cool because then as you edit in the layer, the drop shadows all move around with you. It's kind of like using OS X with the drop down menus. And gradient, <laughs> the, the drop shadows just appear. So it's, it's a really neat feature. And I'm um, actually RSVG supports it a lot. And Firefox doesn't, supports a few of them, not all of them. And so we're really excited to get into Inkscape because we, you know, we saw with the blur edge effect, you kind of get that same effect but it's effectively rasterizing it because it's just doing 11 steps there to create the blur. But actually being able to do it and having it correct is exciting. It opens up a lot of possibilities. Kind of crying out for Bezier gradients? I would say so. Um, I think that, that, I mean, they were talking about gradient improvements for 1.2. I, I don't know what the status of those are. The last time I asked, I heard they were a maybe. So it, the fact that SV 1.2 hasn't happened yet, I can't really say either way. But I think a Bezier gradient would make sense. Um, what we've done in like our GIMP uh, gradient importer is if there's a curved gradient, we just sample it. And it looks pretty good. I mean, 
I, I don't know. Gradients are hard to <laughs> tell specific points on, but. Yep, I'm, I'm not saying it wouldn't be better. I, I think that there would be a really, I think it would be a significant impact because you could do the gradient meshes, you could do curved, if you did Bezier gradients, you can do anything, basically. Um, however you want to curve it, if you want to do parametric or whatever you want to do, you could implement it as a Bezier curve. But uh, they haven't. So until we can figure out a way to implement that in a way for other SVG renderers to see it, we're not going to do it in Inkscape. Any other questions? Thank you, guys.